about how many citizens on average were living in Allensworth? About 250. Okay. Around, it's really hard to kneel down because the population would flux. We don't have a lot of accurate numbers because sometimes the census didn't always count black families the way they count everybody else. But also, um, there were people moving in and out of the community all the time. I don't think it ever exceeded more than 400 people, okay. even at its height, but about 250, roughly. And what were the property laws like then for Well, black for here, families? because they bought the property through the Pacific Farming Company, there were no uh, covenant or deed restrictions on the property. The And that's one of those little What's the way? Hidden ways that racists in California would prevent land to be transferred to people of color is they would put in uh, in uh, the deed covenant restrictions that say that you could not sell to a person of color. And eventually they got rid of those restrictive covenants. But that was like 1950s. Yeah. Here they didn't have those because the property had been sold from the Pacific Farming Company to the California Home Promoting Association, which was an I don't want to say nonprofit, but a corporation formed by Alan Allensworth, Professor Payne, and six other gentlemen that, that started the colony, right? And he has to remember in America right now, at this time period in 1908, there's all of these utopian um, town movements going on in America. So there's this idea that if we set up things right, we can have this utopia where it's just us, just people uh, of like mind, of like, you know, whatever. Uh, and then we can eliminate all the negative and we could rise above. And that was kind of the Colonel's idea is like, why should anyone trust us if we can't show people that we're perfectly capable of founding and running a town on our own? And that was the con his concept. It's like, if you're not gonna let us integrate, we're gonna segregate ourselves and do it by ourselves, right? And we're gonna show you that we can do this wonderful town. And the, this is where he comes into conflict with the black community in Northern California out of San Francisco and the black community in Los Angeles were kind of at odds with one another, saying because most of the Colonel's people were coming from Southern California, although a lot of settlers did come from Alameda and all that. Should we take the W.B. Du Bois position or the Booker T. Washington position? That is, should we force integration by force or should we show people that we're capable of doing everything on our own and then they have to accept us, right? So the Colonel was following in those footsteps of Booker T. Washington, which is why he started the Tuskegee Institute saying, okay, you're not gonna let us play with you. We're gonna do our, our own thing. And we're gonna show you what we're even better at. Okay. So yeah, where Debbie Du Bois was saying, no, we need to force integration. We need to force it now. Right. Uh, but through protests and marches and all this kind of stuff. And, and the others like, eh, maybe not. And he goes on, he carries that position. Although he changes his position throughout his lifetime several times. Uh, I think the colonel's approach was probably the, the better one because, like I said, the colonel was highly respected. He was highly successful. He was the only one at the uh, 1905. He was the only African American there to represent the government, the U.S. government. Frederick Douglass was there, but he was representing the government of Columbia, right? So he'd done a lot of wonderful things, and he was the mover, the shaker behind this entire concept of this town, right? Uh, although Professor Payne and the other men all played an important role in it. I don't want to diminish what they did. But he was the guy with political connections because he was an elector in the ele Electoral College of Elections for James Garfield when he was elected to president. So he was a Republican elector. So he had some clout, right? In 1912, 1913, right in that time period, he led uh, a bid to build a black college here, a black uh, polytechnical college and to make it truly that Tuskegee of the West. That bill was stymied in the California legislature. Legislature, When he died in 1914, that bill disappeared. Boom, dead. Because he was the guy behind it and he was the one who was pushing it. And he had all the connections and all that. Now people talk about the demise of the town and that is a kind of a difficult subject because we're, really what happens is there are a period of events that happen over a period of about 18 months that caused that town to decline and it just never fully recovered. There were still people living here until the 1970s, right? So it's the town that kind of refused to die. It didn't really go away, but the vision died kind of with the Colonel. So 1912, 1913, they, they moved the rail spur. There was a commercial stop. If you look across from us, you can see the rail car. Up on the top of that berm, there would have been two rail cars. One was a ticket office, one was a shipping office. 
and that made Allensworth a commercial rail stop. So they would load grain. There was two warehouses over there that had grain. And at the time, the valley's major crop was not citrus, it was grain, right? And so the average worker was making about $5 a day loading grain. Stevedore work, right? Uh, because it couldn't be done by machines. That's $5 a day versus $12 a week, which was the average wage. So money was coming into the town. Local farmers and some other corporate interests decided, you know what, we need a spur line to Alpha so we can bypass Allensworth. I'm sure it had race, some, race had something to do with it, but also profit margin too, because they were loading sugar beets over in Alpha. And sugar beets was a huge part of producing sugar, right? That makes sense. And they're competing with the sugar now that's coming in from Cuba and Hawaii, Cuba, after the Spanish-American War, are now growing sugarcane. Sugarcane is easier to process than sugar beets, oh. right? So that ends that commercial output, so they no longer have outside cash coming into the community. So now you, you still have people stopping on the rail line, but not like they were, right? And remember, in a rail line at the time, you didn't buy a ticket from Seattle to Washington. You bought a ticket for a thousand miles. Every hundred miles they come along, punch your ticket. So you could get on and off the train anytime you wanted to, and then you just get back on, here's my ticket. You yeah. know, oh yeah, I got 500 miles left. You know, it's uh, kind of a neat way to travel because you get on and off wherever you wanted. Yeah. So they did have some people stopping and using the, the hotel or the bakery or, or even this place. Mm -hmm. So you have that happen. That's around 1913. 1912, you have drought through uh, 12 and 13. 1914, the colonel's killed in Monrovia, California. As he gets off the streetcar, He's struck by a motorcyclist, he's knocked down. Now there's differing reports. Some say they backed over him again. Some say they just ran over him and left. Don't know. I personally think it had something to do with the water rights. It was kind of sending a message. I don't think they intended to kill him. I think they intended to rough him up, but that's, that's my read of it. And it had to do with the water rights. Because right around 1913, Allensworth Water Company loses, they lose the rights to their own water. They failed to pay their taxes on time. So another company comes in, buys it out from under. There's a lot of negotiation going back and forth. They agreed on a sum and they eventually got those water rights back. In 1914, the colonel's killed. Now you can't talk about California politics without talking about water. Right. It all revolves around water, even back then. Because remember, this is saying about the same time period that Los Angeles is growing and they need water, right? Right. And that's when they start stealing, I mean, appropriating water from the Imperial Valley. Uh -huh. Holland and all those guys. Roughly the same time, not exactly, but roughly. Colonel dies, 1914. And around the same time period, they lose the bid to build the Black College. Part of the rationale was there was a 1912 Supreme Court decision in California saying you cannot have segregated schools in California. So if you're gonna build a Black College, you can't do that, kills the bill. Right? So you have all those things happen right around the same time period. Now the town is left without a leader. There's some people that you know, tried to lead Mr. Uh, Dotson, uh, Mr. Overe, um, big time business guys within the community, but they're not as charismatic as the Colonel. And they're not as educated. They're not as worldly as far as, you know, the Colonel's been all over the world. Yeah, he's been in the Philippines, he's been all over the West. He's got the connections. And then he's got that, uh, that gravitas, emotional maturity, but also uh, uh, professional maturity that the others just don't have. So, now we see the tables start to turn, town starts to slow decline. Uh, Professor Payne with a growing family, you know, he can't uh, exist on the salary he's getting in a small town, so he moves to El Centro, where he gets a job as a principal, so he moves up the ladder. The kids that were educated in this town um, could compete with their big city counterparts, right? Because they're very well educated, so. So there's all these opportunities. Are you gonna stay here or are you gonna move to the big city? As someone who joined the military to get out of a little bitty town, I tell you what, yeah. And there's those that join the army because World War One's going on, right? Or it's pretty obvious that we're gonna get into it at some point. Uh, and a lot of the men here are retired army soldiers. So their kids would have been instilled with that. In fact, Oscar Rivera at the age of, I think he was 45, 46, went and joined the army when World War One broke out. So um, a lot of patriots. Uh, so that kind of set the tone and the town just never really recovers from that. Wow. All right. This is the Allensworth Schoolhouse. This was built in 1912. 
This is an original building. It's one of the few original buildings in the park. Most of the buildings are actually reconstructions. And what we do is we take the historical record, we take photographs, we use the archeology, span that is finding it on the ground, and then uh, eyewitness accounts, and we put all those together, and that's where we can say, okay, this is an accurate reproduction of what was here during the day. And then, we, again, we also we have, we have photographs, we have historical maps, uh, we have what's called the Sanborn Fire Maps, and the Sanborn Fire Insurance Company would have detailed maps of different uh, areas. So if you were insured, they would make a map of your neighbors, so if a fire started to warn the neighbors, then they would sue them. <laughs> and they would give you coverage. And so as everybody was being covered, it was very common insurance at the time, you'd have these highly detailed maps of different neighborhoods. And then of course we have the assessor records and, uh, and then eyewitness accounts of people that lived there here in the, back in the historic period, which is 1908 to 1918. And a lot of those interviews were done in the 70s, so these folks have since passed. Uh, but the, we sat, the department had historians sit down with them and record uh, their memories of when they were here at the time. So this is the schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. And Again, you said 1908 to 1918 was? The historic period for the town of Allensworth is 1908 to 1918. And a lot of people think that, that that's arbitrary, but really that is the founding of the town to its decline. So those seem to be the most important period because this, this site, the town site, is on the National Register of Historic Places, which means under Section 106 of the Historic Preservation Act that this area is preserved, it's protected, right? And one of the criteria in order to explain, like a historian to historian, you know, you can say why it's important, but for a historian to tell a politician why it's important, you have to have some definitions. So we define that as 1908 to 1918 as the crucial historic period when it had the most influence on the nation and the region. Uh, and so that's what we interpret. That's the town founding to its town's demise. By 1918, the cast had already been uh, filled and the town was on its decline, although there were people still living here until 1977, excuse me, 73, okay. when the park became a park. The last class to graduate from the school was in 77. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And this right. is a classic two-room schoolhouse. You know, kindergarten through third grade on one side, all other grades on the other. Uh, the primary teacher here was Professor William Payne, a wonderful man by all accounts. He never gave up on a student. If you weren't learning from him the way he was teaching, he would adjust the way he would teach. He would teach practical mathematics, right? So a quart and a, a gallon and that sort of thing. You know, kids right now run away from word problems, but back then that was a way to instill critical learning. Uh, and he would teach, you know, measurements by quart, bushel, gallons, all that kind of good stuff. He would teach basic, basic agriculture, black history as well as American history, uh, mathematics, literature, mythology. Uh, and the kids that went here got a classical education in the fact that they learned the Greek myths. Uh, uh, American history. They learned uh, some basic engineering, mathematics, uh, how to run a farm, how to run a checkbook, that type of thing, how to keep a ledger. You know, some of the things that we probably should still be teaching. And that is something we get away from here. And the Colonel was a big proponent of education wherever he went in the Army. You know, he uh, started in the Army in 1884 and retired in 1906. When he retired, and we're gonna talk more about the Colonel in depth later. Wherever he went in the army, he would start a school. First grade for privates, second grade for corporals, third grade for sergeants. And the basis of that was everyone needed to know how to read and write. Everyone needed to, how to know how to do basic arithmetic. You know, if you're free your mind, your body will follow, type of thing. Right. So, and all of those uh, skills he taught were very, and specifically Professor Payne, they were all practical applications of that process. It wasn't so much Hey, here's what to think. Here's how to conclude your own uh, summary, right? How, not what to think, but how to think. And penmanship, penmanship counted. And you know why? You've, you've probably heard that phrase, why penmanship counts? Well, why does it count? Because nobody could read it. <laughs> it had to be legible. Right. And because correspondence, it's like, if I'm going to write you a letter or send you a message in 1908 America, I'm probably not going to send you a text message. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. I'm not going to send you a telegraph because a telegraph costs money, but I could send you a letter. And so they have these wonderful letters between people. And I think we've lost something uh, uh, with that, that we don't get that connection with people. Uh, 
because a letter is something you've handled, took the time to handle it, to write it down, to seal it up, and put an envelope and put it in the post to me, right? So we have here, like I said, penmanship counts. So here's your pen. Here's your inkwell. So you would dip and then write. Dip and then write. I get about three words, and then I have to redip. And by the time the 20s roll around, these are kind of going out of, the, out of the wayside, and now you have fountain pens where you would suck up the ink into the pen, and now you can write, and it's considered, oh, wow, what, a, what an invention. It's almost like sliced bread. And again, sliced bread comes out right around this time period. Too, about so here we have our tablet. Can you turn that on for me? Um. <laughs> Well, this is a slate or a tablet, and this is what the school kids would do most of their work on. So the teacher would say, all right, open up you know, uh, your mathematics book, do the problems on page four for the third graders, uh, and then write down the answers on your slate. And then he would come by and check them. And this is one of those things that a lot of people don't understand. What this front row for the school benches are is what's called the recitation bench, or the recitation row. So we'd say, all right, and this is how you manage a multiple grade class in one classroom. Third graders come to the front and they would fill these front benches. They would give them their lesson. This is how you do it. I want you to go back to your desks, open McGuffey's Reader, chapter six, read the story, answer the questions in the back. Go back to your desks. First grade, come up to the front. And then they would do this kind of relay race. Some lessons would all come together, right? Uh, but it would be sp specified by grade. So if you look at the back of the classroom, we have two portraits up here I like to always point out. Abraham Lincoln and Booker T. Washington. Now Booker T. Washington had founded the uh, Tuskegee Institute in uh, Tuskegee, Alabama, and his um, influence was pretty profound on the colonel. The colonel had this concept of performing or establishing kind of a Tuskegee of the West, um, and that was kind of the genesis for founding of Allensworth, the town. When he got out of the army, right, he retired in 1906 as a lieutenant colonel. He was the highest ranking African-American officer in the army at the time, and only the second man in U.S. history at the time to become a lieutenant colonel as a chaplain. Chaplains were prohibited from retaining the rank of major, um, simply because the army's tradition was when you went to retirement, they would bump you one rank. So he probably only wore his colonel rank maybe once or twice before he actually got out. And you would take that higher rank in your retirement, and that would be for your pension. So. Uh, a lieutenant colonel was considered kind of part of the aristocracy, and that's a holdover from the Civil War, which the colonel was a uh, veteran of the Civil War. And we'll get more into that when we get to his home. Um, so that's why chaplains were prohibited from that. It was considered a command or a flag rank. And chaplains, you know, they're non-combatants. Right. right? And it, in fact, having, even having a chaplain in uniform was a fairly new idea, right? Because during the Civil War, they had chaplains but they were civilians that came along with the regiment. They weren't actually serving part of the regiment. Right. All right, where, where are we going next? Well, let's go to the Colonel's house. Let's go to the Colonel's house. So when people want to come out to, to visit, they can come out and do basically self-guided tours on their own. They, they can do a self-guided tour on their own anytime they want. We're open uh, eight o'clock in the morning till sundown. Uh, it's six dollars entrance fee. You can do the automated tour, read the read the signs. But if you want to get into the buildings, you have to book a tour through the park office, or you come during a special event. Special events do charge a bit more, and we'll have docents on site, typically in period dress in the different buildings. Uh, okay, Colonel's born 1842, died in 1914. Here we see a piano. We see a lot of pianos in town. Why, everyone always asks this, why do we see so many pianos? Well, if you wanted entertainment, you were on your own. <laughs> it's not like you turn up your iTunes and get the latest stuff. The latest stuff would come in by mail and it would be sheet music. Uh, this is the era of what's called, you know, Tin Pan Alley music, right? Tin Pan Alley was a little place in New York City. These uh, writers would go down and they would pick up a bunch of newspapers, they would read the headlines, and they would compose little ditties to familiar tunes and, and make stories of the popular headlines at the time, right? So if you couldn't read or didn't read well or you didn't get a lot of newspapers, 
a lot of times the news would come through by these little songs. And we see that, like if you look at the songs right around World War I, before World War I, I didn't raise my son to be a soldier. I didn't do this, and I want peace to go on. You see song titles like that. And then after the sinking of the Lusitania, completely changes. Over there, over there, let's, we're going to go over there and, right. and solve that, right? And the music changes, and, and it's part of a, I don't want to say organized or yellow press, but uh, it's kind of in that genre, right? They're influencing public opinion by the music, but also they're popular, right? right? They're popular tunes. And so most everybody had some way of expressing that. Uh, here we see pictures of the uh, Colonel's daughters, Nella and Eva. Eva or Nella. Yeah, Eva and Nella. I always get confused. Um, we see a little Buddha on the piano there. That was a souvenir that he brought home from the Philippines. This house that we're in was built in 1912. It's probably a Sears and Robux house. We're not 100% sure, but it's probably. There's a Sears and Robux house that appears in the 1908 catalog on the same floor plan. It was $795 postage paid, shipped to your door. Wow. And you and your friends put it together over a weekend. All right, and here, this would be a typical um, bedroom for the period, not necessarily a door, but you'd have drapes to separate the rooms. We see over here, we see a, a dressing gown. Uh, we see, this is a 1903 men's uh, mohair jacket. This would have been a dress jacket that the Colonel would have worn. Uh, he was a very slender man by all accounts. <laughs> well, and it was shaped, you know, to fit an in-shape men's figure, okay? Uh, here we have a woman's dress. This is, uh, again, this is in that Edwardian period, not Victorian. So things are loosening up a little bit. They can show a little bit more skin. They can show a little more elbow, a little more neckline. But still, it's all the way down to their ankles. If you ever heard the expression, a well-turned ankle, that meant because if the young lady was flirting with you, she'd lift the hem of her dress and show her ankles. Yeah. Oh, here we have a few accoutrements. Now, the colonel was a non-combatant, but he was an officer. Mm -hmm. Up until 1902, every department of the army had its own saber. So the paymasters had a saber that had a special design to it. The cavalry officers had a saber. A foot officer, infantry officer, would have a saber. A mounted foot officer, which means a lieutenant colonel or above, that's a foot officer that has a horse, had a separate saber. So they all have these designs. And the army said, enough. Let's all go to one pattern. So they came up with this. This, this is the 1902 officer saber. It's a very slender blade. It was not actually designed to be used. It was ceremonial, because by 1902, a sword ceremonial, okay? So he would have had one of these. He would have had to have had one of these because it would have been part of his dress uniform, right? This particular saber comes to us from the West Point uniform shop, okay? And that's a 1902. But again, as a, uh, as a chaplain, he was a non-combatant. He was forbidden weapons, but that was a ceremonial thing. Uh, as a colonel, he was entitled to have his own regimental colors. So again, here we have our regimental colors. Now, for this to be accurate, normally uh, the commanding officer would have the same kind of colors, but uh, they would have streamers. Every battle that the unit fights in, you get a streamer with the name of that battle. So like one of my old units, the 2nd Infantry Division, right? they have uh, uh, battle honors going back to the late Civil War, right? Or the 3rd Infantry Old Guard, that's actually the best uh, uh, example. The 3rd Division Old Guard is one of the Army's oldest units. It actually has streamers from uh, Lexington and Valley Forge and stuff like that because it can trace its unit's history back to that. Which is kind of interesting. That's what's the difference between an army and a mob, right? An army's got tradition and history. Above us, we see this loft. There was actually a loft that there was a bedroom up here. Um, after the colonel's death in 1914, his wife stayed. And uh, when she would reside here, she would often uh, take in boarders. And she would live on the second floor here in the loft. There was a pull-down staircase over about where you're standing. And then she'd run out to the, the, the bottom rooms. And this is actually very, very common at the time period. If a woman suddenly found herself being a widow and the house is paid for, she would take in boarders to make ends meet. And she would cook and clean for them and then charge them a fee. And then she would usually take the smaller room in the house so um, she could get more money. Yeah. So what kinds of things do you, would you like to see happen to 
Allensworth to keep this cultural heritage alive and to get more people well, number one, in knowing about it and supporting it and understanding yeah. its its relevance. I think the, the biggest challenge is getting the word out, getting advertisement. The department as a whole, we do not pay for advertisement, which is simply not in our budget. Secondly, is the infrastructure. A lot of the, a lot of the infrastructure that's here in the park was holdovers from the 70s when it was still a town, and when they built new facilities, they kind of scabbed onto the old ones, and uh, we we find that that's a constant problem here. Uh, roads need to be resurfaced. A lot of times it's not just uh, the visitation, it's just the weather puts wear and tear on the buildings. So it's a constant battle between the weather and the animals, like ground squirrels. And, you know, I used to like squirrels before I started working for state parks. <laughs> not anymore. I saw a huge difference in visitation from the centennial year, where we were in the news like every other week. So visitation was very, very high because there was an awareness of where we were yeah. and how to get here and all that. That's an important factor. Uh, and again, you know, if we have the infrastructure like the campground, we have a campground, 15 spaces for people to stay. It'd be nice to spruce that up, maybe add some uh, hookups for RVs, that type of thing. But in the end, it really comes down to just getting the word out. Well, we are wrapping up at Allensworth, where we just spent the morning with Steve learning all about the great cultural heritage of this area of the valley. Um, we were really excited that you came out to spend the time with us to really give us a history of what was happening here um, and then what's still happening here and how we can support um, as a community this amazing spot. So thank you so much. You're very welcome. Goodbye, friends. We'll see you next time.